Anatomy and Physiology. Today we're going to talk about what's normal with the heart and then kind of help you guys understand what happened to your heart. Um, we're just going to go through some facts and things and then get into more explanation. Uh, some of you have been bypassed, some heart attacks with stent and some valves. So we're going to kind of talk about a little of each. Uh, but as you look at uh, your handout, there's a little guy on there and it's, if we had the PowerPoint up, you would see some red and blue and it's just showing how the blood circulates through our body and the red that's on that handout is arteries and that is uh, arteries that is the blood moving away from the heart. It's already oxygenated and it's going out to feed your organs and tissues and the blue are your veins and it's going back to the heart and that is unoxygenated blood and it just makes the exchange and keeps on going. Um, how the heart works. Um, your heart is only your fist size. When you make a fist, you that's how big your heart should be. But a lot of people do have an enlarged heart. Um, this uh, heart, if I took off the top part of this, this is about a normal size of your heart. Uh, so it is smaller than what most people think. And one of the number one questions that I get is when I'm stented or when I'm bypassed, does the doctor, when he bypassed me, uh, cut my heart open uh, to bypass? And no, he does not. Uh, your arteries are on the outside of your heart, and that's how they're stenting and bypassing because the arteries are on the outside of the heart. When we open the heart, you will see valves, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. But these white uh, things are the valves that you have. Um, the heart is on the left side of your chest, but it's not totally to the left. It's just off center of your breastbone. Um, and when we listen to your heart rate, we are listening on the upper part of your chest, but we also listen down low on your chest. And the reason we listen down low is because it's the loudest point that we can hear your heart rate. And this right here on the heart is called an apex. And that uh, means a point. And when we listen down lower on your chest, uh, we're, that's where we can hear the loudest heart rate to hear it and count it accurately because it's the loudest point down here towards the apex. Um, you have four chambers to your heart. Uh, there's two on the right side, two on the left. Your upper part is called an atrium or atria for right and left. And then there's ventricles, the right and left ventricle. The left ventricle is the main pump to your heart. If you remember talking to your doctor at any point before uh, or after uh, your uh, procedure, he may have said EF or ejection fraction and he may have given you a percentage. Well, when he's giving you that percentage, he's giving you how strong your left ventricle is. And normal for a left ventricle is 50 to 65%. That is normal pumping function. Uh, most people think it's 100% because everything we're taught uh, to be normal is 100. And for this, no, it's not because your heart never pumps all the blood out. Uh, so 50 to 65%. Um, and on one of your handouts at the end that I'm talking about, uh, we will give you your ejection fraction so you know. Um, there's a lot of things that affect uh, how strong that ventricle is. And it could be that you... Uh, have too high a blood pressure that's been out of control too long and that can affect what your ejection fraction is. You could have had a huge heart attack and you waited too long to come to the emergency room. Uh, some people unfortunately get uh, a cardiomyopathy caused from unknown cause to from drug abuse or too much alcohol that affects that left ventricle. Um, so we will talk about your uh, left ventricle and that ejection fraction on one of the last handouts we talk about. Uh, in your handout that you have, it says the interior part of your heart. And it's just showing how your heart's uh, circulation works and goes through the different chambers. Uh, but we have four valves in our heart. We have a tricuspid valve, a mitral valve, an aortic valve, and a pulmonary valve. And those valves uh, can be replaced or repaired if something happens to them. Um, now, babies across the street at Children's Mercy, some people are just born uh, with bad valves. And these babies across the street start having open heart surgery within two or three months of their life. And then as they get older, because we outgrow valves, uh, they have several surgery. Uh, if they have it at birth, 
then they'll have another surgery when they're 12 or 13 years old, and then they're going to have surgery again uh, maybe at 18, 19, 20, because now they're not in a child valve, they need an adult valve. Um, so some people are just born with bad valves. Uh, other valve disease is caused from drug abuse. IV drug users, as we know, use uh, dirty needles. And when you use dirty needles, um, you get infection, and that infection goes straight to your heart, which then attacks your heart, and it attacks a valve, and you get a deadly disease called endocarditis, uh, and it can cause death if you don't get that treated. So that's one way that valves can go bad. Uh, just old age, because you're, uh, you can build up some plaque and they get narrow, uh, you need valve surgery. Um, sometimes just a high fever. So it's real important, especially as we go into the flu season, into the fall and winter, uh, why we stress the flu shots. Uh, and a lot of people say, I'm not taking the flu shot because I get the flu from the vaccine, which is false. You cannot get the uh, flu from the vaccine because it's a dead virus. Uh, you may get... Um, a little soreness or achiness within the next 24, 48 hours, but you don't actually get the flu. Uh, and the flu uh, vaccine only fights against what they think the major flu viruses are going to be for that season. Uh, but you can still get other flu bug stuff that's not influenza. Uh, you can get GI stuff or some upper respiratory things. Uh, so it is important. But the main thing I'm telling you about that flu vaccine is when we do uh, get all these sicknesses in the fall and winter, uh, some of them make you run a fever. And when you run a fever, it's very important if you run a fever for more than 24 hours, you need to see a doctor. Because a fever more than 24 hours, a lot of times it is a bacterial infection. And when it's bacterial, you need an antibiotic. And if you don't get a bacterial infection treated, it goes throughout your bloodstream and can attack a heart and then you end up uh, killing one of your heart valves. Um, the teeth, the teeth is another thing that people don't understand that when you have a toothache, um, it's very important to get to a dentist. And we do know that people are afraid to go to a dentist either just from their own fear because they don't have uh, the dental insurance. So we refer people either over to our oral surgeon here at Truman or to UMKC uh, because teeth, when they get infected and they're not taken care of, they go straight to the heart. Uh, and you will end up uh, killing a heart valve. Now, when you get a heart valve replaced, uh, there's a couple different kind of valves that we use. Uh, there's a tissue valve, and we either use pig or cow. Uh, the pros and cons of a tissue valve is the pro is you don't have to take the drug called warfarin or coumadin, which uh, is a blood thinner. Um, and you can eat whatever you want. You don't have to get stuck on a regular basis to see if your blood is thin enough. Um, the downside of having a tissue valve, they only last right now an average of about 10 years. Uh, so depending on the age that you are, uh, depends on if you're going to need that surgery again. And if you're only 40 years old and you get a tissue valve, um, then you're going to need surgery down the road again because of the lasting of only approximately 10 years. The other type of valve that we use is uh, the mechanical valve. And when you do a mechanical valve, it is a titanium, uh, basically ball and metal. Uh, and if this room was quiet and someone had a mechanical valve and there was no uh, noise whatsoever, you can hear somebody's mechanical valve. Uh, it's a clicking sound that you can hear when it's totally silent. Uh, they never need surgery again, so that's the best part of having a mechanical valve. The downside is they are on Coumadin the rest of their life, uh, which a lot of people that know anything about Coumadin don't want that. Uh, it's a blood thinner, they're having frequent blood draws, and there's certain things in their diet they must really watch. I use myself as an example on this um, because also depending on some of your hobbies that you may have, uh, would you do a tissue valve or would you do a mechanical valve? The reason I use myself as you guys are in cardiac rehab, one thing that you learn about me on a personal level is that I ride a Harley Davidson. And if I was needing a valve replacement, uh, the doctors try and help you decide and make the decision more yours. He gives you the pros and cons of both and help you decide. Well, one thing he would tell me is if you're going to continue to motorcycle ride, 
we're not going to put a mechanical valve in you. Uh, the reason for that is, as anyone knows, uh, motorcycles are known to be high risk, uh, not necessarily due to us on the motorcycle, but due to the cars that uh, claim they don't see us or hear us. And if we had a crash, uh, the chance of me bleeding to death would be huge, and then I would die. So would I give up my most favorite hobby? I don't know. Another hobby would be people that horseback ride. Horseback riding, we know that people are thrown from horses, uh, not planning on it, and blunt trauma, they could bleed internally to death. So there's things to consider. Other people that cannot have a mechanical valve is a woman that's in childbearing age because once you uh, have a mechanical valve, you cannot stop Coumadin. And if they're going to decide to have children, uh, you can never stop Coumadin. Um, so childbearing age, uh, they have to only have a tissue valve. Also, anybody of an elderly age, and I use that word lightly because I've taken care of very old 40-year-olds and very young 80-year-olds. But anyone at high fall risk cannot have a mechanical uh, valve uh, because of a fall risk. But definitely the older we get and depending on what's going on in our life and health issues, makes a, they determine if we're a fall risk and if we can have mechanical or tissue. Um, we've already talked about what causes those uh, the valves to fail. Um, a lot of their symptoms are chest pain, shortness of breath, can't lay down flat, you might have heart palpitations, you could pass out, ankle foot swelling. Um, those are the most common symptoms when a valve's going bad. Most valves know ahead of time. They may know as much as five to 10 years before that sometime in their life that they're gonna need valve surgery. When rheumatic fever was around back in the day, people that had rheumatic fever knew that at some point in their uh, life, they would need a valve replacement or repair because that affected their mitral valve. Some people uh, get one or two years notice that their valve is having some problems and in the future will need a uh, repair or replacement. And unfortunately, there is a small portion of valve people that find out six weeks or two weeks before surgery. Uh, but most people do know, unlike someone that has bypass surgery, because bypass surgery, they usually get no warning. They come in the emergency room, chest pain, and find out we can't stent, and then they're going off for bypass. Um, we're now gonna flip pages a little bit and talk about the electrical side of the heart. Um, there's two sides to your heart. Uh, we have the plumbing side and then we have the electrical side. And so there's kind of two different kinds of cardiologists. We call them plumbers and electricians. And these cardiologists do know they even call themselves that. Uh, the plumbers we have here at Truman, they're the ones that take you to the cath lab and do the heart catheterization. And they're the ones that put the stents in. Or if they can't put stents in, they'll send John off for bypass surgery. We do not have electricians here. Uh, electricians are the ones that specialize on your heart rhythm, and they're the ones that put pacemakers in, defibrillators in, and they also do a procedure called an ablation, which I'll talk about here in a minute. Uh, when we need the electrician, we have a contract with St. Luke's Hospitals. They come over and they put our uh, pacemakers and our defibrillators in for us. And if there's other electrical problems, um, they will will send you on off to St. Luke's to uh, have them further do studies over there because they have the equipment. But within our heart, we have our own personal pacemaker, uh, not the kind that's implanted, uh, but it's an electrical uh, aspect. It's called the SA node, and all of us have it in our heart, and it is what sets each and one, every one of our heart rate, where one person has a heart rate of 72 at rest, and someone else 96, and someone else at 60. Um, so we have that pacemaker, but sometimes that pacemaker isn't working uh, on a regular basis or on a normal basis. And some people have some irregular rhythms. The most common rhythm that we see in cardiac rehab and in our cardiac patients is AFib or atrial fibrillation. And that rhythm is a very irregular rhythm, and it's when your atrium which I talked about at the beginning, you have a right and a left, but your atrium shakes like jello versus making an actual contraction like uh, a normal uh, heart rhythm. And when you look at your handout, there's an example of a heart rhythm on there, and it says a P wave, a QRS, and a T wave. Well, the P wave is your atrium making a normal contraction, and that rhythm that's in your handout 
uh, is your atrium making a normal contraction and that's a normal sinus rhythm. That's what we want everybody's heart to look like. But um, when you have AFib, that's a squiggly line all the way across uh, and that's an AFib where it's not contracted normally. An AFib is not life-threatening, but it can cause complications, and the biggest complication it uh, has is a stroke, and obviously we don't want patients to have a stroke. So when we find someone in AFib, our first goal is if the heart rate's going way too fast, is to slow it down, uh, and we slow it down by using medications. Our next goal is once we get it slowed down, is to try and get you out of that rhythm by medications. Uh, if medications don't get you out of it, the next way we use is uh, using the defibrillator, bringing anesthesia to you, letting them put you asleep for one or two minutes, and we shock you with the paddles to try and shock you into a normal rhythm. And sometimes that works. And then the third thing we do is an ablation, which is when we would send you to St. Luke's. And what that is, is uh, the cardiologist goes up through your groin in your veins, not your arteries, and he does this study. And the study can take two to four to six hours, a very long time, you're sedated. And he's trying to trigger within your heart the pathway your heart's going to make you be in an irregular rhythm. Uh, and he'll hit different points when he's up inside, and when he sees that your rhythm, when he hits a point and sees your rhythm go where he wants it to go, he puts like an X there. And he does that throughout your heart. Then what the ablation is, it is a thing like a soldering iron that goes through your groin, um, and he goes up and he burns everywhere where he put an X. And when he does that is it burns the pathway, so when your heart tries to go in that electrical way, that pathway has been burnt, so it, he knocks it back into a normal rhythm. So sometimes that's what's done for AFib. AFib happens in about 25% of the patients that have had either bypass or valve surgery, uh, and can happen in our stent patients, uh, because with the catheters and balloons and everything up there, uh, it can make your heart irritable, and just from the irritability, it can knock it into a normal Normal rhythm. Our bypass and valve patients, it's because the heart gets irritable from the surgeon playing with it for so many hours or on certain valves that he's either replacing or repairing, he's up by that SA node and it can knock it out of rhythm. Um, so it does happen in about 25% of the patients. When it happens, if you're someone that's never had AFib, uh, when we get you out, you usually will never have a problem again. Uh, people that have had the underlying rhythm before, they may continue to have that problem. And there is a small percentage of patients uh, that unfortunately, if it happens, we can't get you out. And if we can't get you out, it's just keeping you rate controlled below the rate of 100 uh, and protecting you against stroke. And how we protect you against a stroke, there's a scale the doctors use. Some people unfortunately have to go on Coumadin. Some just have to take a full aspirin for the rest of their life versus a baby aspirin. Um, signs of that you're in AFib would usually when it's fast, if it's going a regular rate, you're usually not going to know you're in it unless you go to the doctor. But if it's going fast, you'll feel the heart palpitations, uh, you'll get short of breath, you fatigue, you'll feel your heart beating up in your throat and neck. And what you do is call 911 and go to the hospital and they will take care of it to slow your rate down and hopefully get you out of that uh, rhythm. Um, now we're going to go on and talk about this handout that you have. And on this handout that you have, uh, what I like all of you to do, if you are interested, is you put your name on it and then you return it to us uh, at the end of this class. And we will go into your heart cath report and color it up and show you what your actual blockage is, where your stints are at. Um, and also write on your ejection fraction or how strong that ventricle is. Um, the reason I like to do this, it gives you a more visual of what took place uh, in your heart because a lot of times the doctors say, oh, we only put two stints in and everything else looks great. And then I give you this piece of paper back and you see that I show that you might have 20% blockage one place and 30% here. But then you say, the doctor told me I didn't have anything else. Well, 20 and 30% is nothing that we stint. We don't stint till you're 70% or above, uh, and you don't bypass before that. Um, so once you're 70% and above, um, then we'll stint. And depending on what the disease looks like uh, is how we decide if it 
is stentable or you need to go on to bypass. Uh, but what this um, handout, what I like to describe before you get it back is, this is the aorta, which is the mother of the heart or the coronary arteries. And as you see, these coronary arteries all come off of that aorta. This big long one down here, it says LAD. The full name for it is left anterior descending. Uh, that is the main artery that feeds the front part of your heart. That is also considered the widow maker. Uh, so some of you may know what the widow maker is, but when you shut off way up high, cl the closer you get to the aorta, um, the reason they call it the widow maker, uh, if you shut down that high, um, you have made someone a widow. And for many, many years, they have called that um, artery that. And then as you see, there's branches off that. This one down here is called the circ or the circumflex, and that feeds the posterior or the back side of your heart. And then it has branches off of it. And then the RCA uh, or the right coronary artery that feeds the inferior or the inside part of your heart. Those are the three main arteries with all of the branches off. And then this little stub up here that's in the aorta, that's called the left main artery. Um, and it is just that, the left main. We do not stent the left main artery. The only way that artery ever gets stented is if you are someone that has previously been bypassed because when you're bypassed to that, then we call it you're protected. Uh, but if when we put a balloon in or a stent, we temporarily shut the circulation down. And if we shut the circulation down there, we shut off all circulation to your LAD and your circumflex and that is not compatible with life. So we do not stent that unless you've already been bypassed. So you will return these um, and then the following exercise day, it will come back and it'll be colored up uh, so you can get a more visual uh, of where your stents are and do you have some maybe disease building up but yet that we cannot stent yet uh, so we want you to control it with your medicine, your diet, your exercise, and smoking. And then to end is what I'm going to do is pass around so you all know what a balloon and stent look like. Um, this is a true wire with a balloon and you can play with it. Uh, and to deflate the balloon, just pull the syringe back where you see the balloon is flattened. And as you, as you put air into it, and then when you press on the balloon, you can press on it to feel the firm, just don't squeeze too hard. So you can actually see what a balloon looks like of how they put your stents in. And then in this test tube is what a stent looks like. Ignore that one part of the stent has been collapsed from someone squeezing it. Um, but if this was before it went in, just so you know, this stent would be totally flat this balloon would be flat and the balloon would actually be in the middle of the stent, both collapsed and when they, they guide it up to where your blockage is at, put it where they need it and then when they blow the balloon up, this stent gets expanded uh, up against the walls and pushes that plaque against the walls. Um, so pass that around. Uh, the stent is a titanium metal. Uh, there is uh, drug eluding stents and uh, bare metal stents. Uh, there's different ways that they decide of which stent they use. If you have a bare metal stent, you only need to be on Plavix or Berlinta for 30 days. Uh, and for anyone up against a colonoscopy or any type of surgery, if it's hip surgery, knee surgery, back surgery, or any type of surgery, um, they're going to put a bare metal stent on you so you can come off that Plavix and or Berlinta uh, and go ahead and have the surgery more quick. If you have a drug eluding stent, you need to be on Plavix or Berlinta for a year. We cannot stop it before that. So if you are in need of, uh, due to pain for a knee or back or hip, we wanna go ahead and get that surgery done sooner than later to get your recovery going. What a drug eluding stent means is for six weeks, the stent has a drug on it that is a time release and it releases over the next six weeks because when this stent is put in your body, as the blood is flowing through, it's going through the, the wire mesh that you're looking at uh, and can get all tangled up in that wire mesh and cause a blood clot. 
and that's why you're on Plavix or Berlinta. And what that drug eluding stint does is help decrease that chance of any blood clot happening while your body makes a smooth epithelial lining around the inside of that stent to make it nice and smooth. And it takes six weeks for your body to make that epithelial lining so it's smooth. And so the drug that's on the stent releasing for six weeks just uh, helps to decrease that chance of a blood clot. Um, the drug eluding stents, uh, they look at where your blockage is at and that depends on how, uh, which stent they're gonna choose also of. Uh, if you're just straight, down here, they're probably gonna use a bare metal, but if you're at a bifurcation or where it's connecting to two or way up high up here, they're gonna use a drug eluding stent.